um, a pilot with more than 3,000 hours of flight time, 100 hours of flight time on the four tri motors. Tin goose. Tin goose, thank you. Um, he's been involved for the four tri motor restoration since 2008. When he's not volunteering with the Tri Motor Heritage Foundation, he is a senior VP at Bard and has spent the last 37 years as an investing advisor. And he's a very quick turnaround on emails, which I really appreciate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's quite an honor to be here. Thank you so much for having me. What, what time is the classical music event later this afternoon? Three o'clock? I will get you out of here in plenty of time. Boy, if I speak for that long, somebody's got to get the hook out. So uh, I want to just move this over so I can go through the presentation. Can everyone hear me okay? I, I don't. Okay. Very good. So I want to just talk a little bit about our organization for starters, and then we'll get into some history. There's, I'm sorry? Sure. Is that better? No, that, that's fine. I, I can do that. Okay. So the Trimotor Heritage Foundation is uh, an organization that was incorporated in 2009, and uh, we gained not-for-profit status in February of 2011. The organization is dedicated to restoring and eventually flying one of the Island Airlines Ford Tri-Motors. We're just about ready to fly that airplane. We hope to fly it by the end of summer next year. So end of summer 2024. Thank you. It's, it started out as an idea, kind of a crazy idea actually, looking back on it. In 2004, a group of guys sitting around a hangar thinking, boy, that, that was a cool and romantic history. We should, someone should try to preserve that. So. Uh, I, it actually, no one had any idea it was going to be as involved as it became, but uh, here we are. So without any further ado, what I want to talk about first is I want to talk about the Ford Trimotor and the genesis of the Ford Trimotor. Then I want to talk about the history of Island Airlines. And then thirdly, I want to talk about the Trimotor Heritage Foundation and the project and our volunteers because it's something we're all really proud of. So let's start out by uh, talking a little bit about Henry Ford. And most people don't fully appreciate how important the Fords were to commercial and civil aviation. So most people think that uh, Henry Ford was involved in automobiles and that's it. But the truth is, is that most of the major airlines owe a debt of gratitude to Henry Ford and Edsel Ford. It started out pretty simply. Edsel Ford met a man by the name of William Stout at the Detroit Athletic Club in 1924. And Edsel Ford was enamored with this new idea of aviation. And Henry Ford wasn't sold, but he certainly wanted to encourage his son's interest in this new and novel science called aviation. So here's a picture of Henry Ford and Edsel standing behind one of the original Fords. This would have been roughly uh, summer of 1926. So the Stout Metal Aircraft Division of the Ford Motor Company was founded in Dearborn, Michigan. And it's associated with lots of firsts in aviation, first cement runways, first control towers, first primitive forms of aviation, all related to Henry Ford. On the screen now, you'll see uh, the success of the Ford design spawned a whole bunch of airlines. On the upper left, that's TWA, started out as TAT, but TWA. That's American Airlines. That's, uh, I believe that's United Airlines. No, that's Northwest Airlines. That's United Airlines. Um, American Airlines, Aeromexico, Continental Airlines, you name it, they started with, uh, with uh, the Ford Trimotor. Most people don't fully appreciate that. Henry Ford built 199 of these aircraft. What's the TAT stand? 
Great question. It stands for Transcontinental Air Transport. It was the first transcontinental airline. It was the uh, predecessor of what is now TWA, what became TWA. And for about $500 in 1928, you could fly from New York to Los Angeles, California in the blistering speed of 48 hours. Now, when you think about that, that's crazy. These days, you could drive a car if you were dedicated, 24. But back in the day, in 1928, that trip would have taken a couple of weeks. It was about $500. It was reserved primarily for those among us who could afford a very expensive ticket. That's roughly a five or $6,000 ticket in today's dollars. So TAT became, Transcontinental Air Transport became TWA. Good question. So let's go back to 1920 when the first Ford Tri-Motors flew. So around the 1920s, aviation started really blossoming. And the aircraft that were flown in the 1920s were primarily these light aircraft that had wooden frames with a canvas or cotton fabric stretched over them. And the power plants were not terribly reliable. On top of that, the pilots themselves were known as daredevils. And uh, it was definitely the bastion of uh, these things, these guys called barnstormers, who would literally fly their light aircraft into agricultural cities, pay a farmer a couple of bucks to land in his field, and give rides to the local population for those that had the nerve to go for a ride for about a buck each. <laughs> now, the problem with this was is that aviation was terribly dangerous. It wasn't just the daredevil pilots but it was the aircraft themselves. They were not reliable. As I indicated earlier, their engines were not reliable. And oftentimes the fabric would come unglued from the wood, which obviously created a lift issue. On top of that, airmail, which was inaugurated in 1918 with 40 World War I flying aces, would fly mail primarily from the East Coast to Chicago. By 1926, when the first Ford Trimotor was developed, fully 26 of those 40 pilots, those initial pilots, perished in aviation-related accidents. So aviation was incredibly dangerous back in the day. Now, to me, any thinking man wouldn't even consider aviation as being a possible form of transportation for the masses. But actually, that's exactly the opposite of what Henry Ford thought. He thought if he could develop an aircraft with three engines in the event that one failed, and an aircraft made of an aluminum skin that was much more durable and stronger than the typical aircraft of the day, he would be able to develop airlines. Literally, this is how he thought. So. He sponsored in June of 1925, originally he sent out uh, requests for aircraft from around the world to come to something called the Ford Air Reliability Tour, where a number of aircraft, 20 to be precise, 20 aircraft showed up in September of 1925 in Dearborn, Michigan. And if you look at this picture here, you'll see some of the aircraft lined up and then right there, that's the uh, Henry Ford Museum in the background. And the old Henry Ford Airport was just adjacent to the, uh, the uh, Henry Ford Museum and part of what is now called Greenfield Village is where the airport used to be. Anyway, he invited aircraft from around the world to join in this reliability tour where they would fly a 1900 mile course over a period of a couple of days and they had 10 city stops. So 20 aircraft and 20 aircraft crew showed up from all over the world, as I indicated. And when they showed up, Henry Ford, in uh, September, on September 17th, the night before the event started, had them all as guests to his house, a place called Fairlane near, near Dearborn, which was this grand mansion, beautiful place, and invited all the air crew to come and celebrate the beginning of the race, where he wined them and dined them and had dinner and dancing. And in the meantime, a man by the name of Fred Hicks, his lead engineer, and four other engineers rolled every single aircraft design into a hangar. 
and took critical measurements of every aircraft entered into the race, including making copper forms of the airframe and the, sh the shape of the wing. So when these 20 aircraft finished the race, and the number one winner, by the way, the aircraft that won was most durable was an airplane called a Fokker, F-O-K-K-E-R, just to be clear. <laughs> Dutch aircraft manufacturer, three engines on the left there, or I'm sorry, on the right, three engines, wooden airframe with fabric stretched over that airframe. And the number two airplane was an, an aircraft called a Dornier, which was a German entrant that had corrugated aluminum skin. Both aircraft to be, proved to be incredibly reliable. Lo and behold, in September of 25, at the end of the race, you'll notice that the aircraft on the right is again the Fokker. The aircraft on the left is the Ford Trimotor. Suspiciously interesting, I think, how, how close they look. And rumor has it that when uh, Fokker first saw the airplane, the Ford Trimotor, roll off the assembly line in June of 26, he telegraphed Ford with some rather colorful language and told him that if he would have known he was going to steal his design, he never would have entered his effing race, which I think is pretty interesting. Nonetheless, the two aircraft, the uh, Dornier and the Fokker put together, proved to be a very interesting design. The Ford Trimotor is what emerged. The Ford Trimotor actually had one difference from both of those two aircraft. This, this fellow by the name of Fred Hicks that I mentioned earlier, he actually used a slightly different style for the wing. So the airfoil was a little bit different, a little more advanced, and was actually designed by uh, the National Aeronautics Conference, which was used to be referred to as NACA. Okay. So this aircraft is a Ford Trimotor, one of the five remaining flying of the 199 built. This aircraft is called Eastern Air Transport. It's Eastern Airlines' very first aircraft. And this is the uh, aircraft that I had the great pleasure of flying at various air shows a few years back. Um, lift, you know, hopping rides and uh, places like Oshkosh, Wisconsin and um, Lakeland, Florida and uh, Columbia, South Carolina and a few other places. Really cool airplane to fly and, uh, and historic aircraft as well. There are still 18 aircraft on the uh, registry. Most of those aircraft are rolled into, have been rolled into museums. They'll never fly again. Uh, these aircraft are incredibly valuable and incredibly rare. There are still that are five that are still flying. And show of hands, um, anyone here go for a ride in a Ford Trimotor in the last few years? So th there have been a few times when you've had an opportunity to ride a Ford Trimotor right here in Port Clinton. The aircraft uh, does a national tour and shows up here and you can hop a ride in a Ford Trimotor. Another show of hands, how many people remember the old tin goose flying back and forth to the islands? That's great. You know, it might surprise you to know that if you're 40 and younger, you probably have no idea what we're talking about up here, <laughs> which I think is really interesting. So, <clears throat> nonetheless, um, five are still flying. The aircraft that we're restoring, so far we've raised $2.4 million dollars to uh, restore this aircraft. The aircraft uh, requires about another 80 or 90,000 to complete. Like I said, we'll complete the aircraft with any luck uh, end of summer next year and begin test flying it next year. Um, uh, yes? Do you have to fabricate all your parts then? Yeah, we'll get into that a little bit later, but I will tell you that, well, again, we were very naive when we started this process. So uh, we, we recovered an airplane from Montana one of the aircraft that actually flew for Island Airlines. And uh, when we recovered the aircraft, we thought, boy, what a stroke of luck. We, we have all the components that we need to actually restore this plane. And as luck would have it, the aircraft was in such a, a state of decomposition that every single component on the aircraft has been handmade, with the exception of about four or five very, very small pieces, which I could point out to you here. Um, there's a, there's a 
little component here that looks like a horn. It's actually called a control horn. And on that control horn, it's, a, it's made of a hardened steel. There's one on each side, and uh, we had a, something called non-destructive testing done to that to make sure that it was airworthy. Those components could be used. There's a couple of other components back here that are similar hardened steel. So literally, I think there are five components on the aircraft that we could use from the original. Everything else was whole, wholly handmade. And when we get aluminum into our facility, the aluminum comes in in sheets and we have to by hand corrugate it. And uh, that, that's just one of the many stories I could tell you about the process. So that's why it's taken so long to build it. So I've been involved for 15 years and um, it's slow but steady progress. It's something we're really proud of, but boy, it's been quite a journey. So that's a good question, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to back up a minute. Um, when you were talking about the Fokker tri-motor yeah. made out of wood and fabric, yes, my wife and I happened to be going through Kansas about a month ago and discovered that when Newt Rockney was killed, he was in that plane. That's correct. And he was. That's exactly right. So Newt Rockney was, boy, you know, there's so, I mean, he got fucked. Can I say that? Uh, that's really good. Um, yeah, so there's there's so much history here, uh, and I, I really I just I'm so passionate about the old Ford tri motors. Um, you're absolutely right. Newt, Newt Rockney was killed in a Fokker tri motor, and the aircraft came apart in bad weather, and uh, they do they do believe it was a delamination that caused that aircraft to go down. So again, aluminum. Is a much stronger and superior uh, material. And in fact, because we knew very little about aircraft design back in June of 26, when these first aircraft rolled off the facility, uh, off the, uh, off, off the uh, assembly line, we didn't know that much. So the aircraft are literally overbuilt. And most aer aeronautical engineers will tell you a Ford trimotor is overbuilt by a factor of about nine or 10 times what it needs to be which is pretty fascinating uh, when you think about it. It has, as an example, three main spars on the wing as opposed to most modern aircraft which have one carry-through main spar. So they just overbuilt the aircraft. Now why did the aircraft, if it was so important to civil aviation and, and, and so important to the, the genesis of airlines, what happened? Well, a whole host of things happened, but generally speaking, it's considered that the Douglas DC-2, which became the DC-3, and another aircraft called the Boeing 247, were literally aircraft that were being built around 1935 or so, their first aircraft. And these aircraft were faster. They, were, they could carry more passengers. They had de-icing equipment and the ability to travel through more weather. So these aircraft, as an example, the DC-3 was an aircraft capable of speeds of about 160 miles an hour compared to a Ford Tri-Motor. And uh, I've got some time in a Ford Tri-Motor and anyone tells you it goes 120 miles an hour is absolutely wrong. Uh, that's what the book says it does. But uh, that, that would be uh, with a tailwind over a cliff, maybe. Uh, Aircraft cruises between 85 and 95 miles an hour, depending on weight and, and weather. Um, so when you have an aircraft that can handle much larger passenger load, uh, handle weather more adeptly, and is just a much faster aircraft, it was time for the Ford Tri-Motor, although it was a proof of concept, to sort of go to stage left. And that's what happened. It's also true that by 1933, uh, the, the country was in real bad economic shape. And some of the private purchasers of the Ford Tri-Motors, some of the like Standard Oil companies as an example, or Timken Bering out of Akron, they bought Tri-Motors as private aircraft. And these air aircraft back in 1930, 31, were about $50,000 back in the day. It's a lot of money. And uh, the, the economy simply wasn't supporting that kind of corporate air travel anymore. So. There was really no need to continue to build four tri-motors, particularly when these other aircraft were coming on stream. So that was the end of the roll, run of the Ford tri-motor. They were built between 1926 and 1933.
okay? Okay, so let's move on. Um, let's move on to Island Air Service and the old Island Airlines, which I'm particularly interested in because of our shared passion for history. I hope you find this part of the, uh, the presentation fascinating. I think it's fascinating. Um, so Island Airlines operated, as we know Island, Island Airlines, from 1930 to 1977. It did continue on after 1977, but these aircraft were Cessnas, Little Pipers. They were not the Ford Tri-Motors and the, the old De Havilland Otters and Beavers that, that Island Airlines used to fly. So Island Airlines started kind of serendipitously um, when in the late fall of 1929, a passenger ferry called the Mascot foundered off of Kelly's Island in December of 1929. It's thought that uh, the Mascot hit an early season ice flow. Um, the boat went down pretty quickly. There was another ferry out of the Newman boat line out of Sandusky, Ohio that came alongside, got everyone off the ferry and no one perished. Um, that, that boat was uh, called uh, the Messenger. So the Messenger took everyone off the mascot and uh, that left Islanders with a big problem. They had lots of cartage that had to come off the island before the bad weather of the winter came in for the winter of 2930. And it also, there were a lot of people still on the island that wanted to get to the mainland. So they had a problem. They had more people in Cartage on the island than they could get off. So an enterprising young man by the name of Milt Hirschberger thought, this is a great opportunity for me. And this is the airplane that Mil Milt Hirschberger flew. This airplane is uh, called a Waco Model 9. And what's interesting about it is it's Liquid cooled aircraft that are liquid cooled are not heard of these days. Um, but there's a little radiator there just below the top wing of the biplane. And uh, the passenger, the uh, pilot sat in back and two passengers up front. And uh, what he did is he, it's amazing, two passengers up front. And they were, they were, these people accepted a certain level of risk to get in that airplane, right? In December of 29, you, you really wanted to get to the mainland. So there weren't airports over on the island back in these days. So he was flying in and out of fields until the ice froze. And once the ice froze pretty thoroughly, they literally went out there and cleared off the ice for the airplane to land off Kelly's and Putin Bay and Middle Bass and North Bass. He was landing on the ice until spring. At which time, volunteers on the islands literally went out, volunteered to clear a path for a runway on each island. In fact, the island on the airport on South Bass Island is the exact same place where the airport was originated. The, the airport on Middle Bass is not the same place. The one on North Bass is, and the one on Kelly's is not in the original spot either. But there's a few of them that, were, that are actually in the original spot. Rattlesnake as well, but he was not operating in and out of Rattlesnake until much later. And we'll talk a little bit about that in just a few minutes. So in 1930, flying back and forth. And then in 1931, he got a mail contract. He literally went to the post office and said, hey, I can run mail back and forth. And once he got that, he was on his way. So he literally borrowed another biplane, borrowed it from a friend. And this was called a new standard biplane. It's the one that's larger. This picture was uh, believed to have been taken in midsummer of 1930 off put in, at Putin Bay. That hangar still exists. So this is the WAC 09 that started it all, and that's the new standard. Now the new standard, same configuration, pilot sits in back, four passengers in front. So now we're really moving people. Right now we're really moving people. So, so by 1934 or so, Milt Hirschberger had a burgeoning business. People on the islands took to flying. They actually viewed it as this is a viable way to get to and from the mainland. Of course, the populations were small and isolated and word traveled fast that this Milt guy was a safe pilot 
and lo and behold, people started flying with him. So that's Milt right there in his first Ford trimotor, which Milt couldn't afford the $50,000 to buy a Ford trimotor in 1934, but he had heard of an airplane that crashed, run out of gas, had run out of gas near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He paid $2,500 for that wreckage, and over the next two years, he restored it. And in October of 1936, October of 36, he flew the first Ford trimotor, November 7584, from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, to Port Clinton, Ohio. He learned to fly it on his own. He taught himself to fly a Ford trimotor. So, <clears throat> excuse me, over the years, uh, Island Airlines owned a series of eight Ford trimotors. Here's two of them, November 7584, number one, that's his first Ford trimotor, and that's the second one, that's November 7684, which he had renumbered. They weren't consecutive in the, back in those days, but he uh, lobbied the Civilian Aeronautics Authority, the predecessor to the FAA, and had the numbers uh, made similar and they approved it. So that's November 7584, November 7684, also on Putin Bay, and there's that hangar once again, same hangar. That hangar still exists. So that's the beginning of Island Airlines. They owned eight Ford trimotors over their history. Six of them flew regularly. Two of them were owned for less than 30 days. It's likely that Milt saw an opportunity to buy one cheaply and turn around and sell it to a third party because both were registered for less than 30 days. So beg, borrow, or steal, keep that thing flying, right? Keep the airline moving. The role that the aircraft played in the lives of the people living on the island cannot be overstated. It was literally a component of the fabric of their lives and really a symbol of their rugged lifestyle. So in these aircraft, it was not unusual to have people fish, and beer barrels on the same flight. Literally, passengers would sit on fishing nets or barrels of wine or crates of fish or whatever was in there. Milt Hirschberger or his sidekick, a man by the name of Harold Houck, would say, have a seat. If you were going over, the, over to Putin Bay or Middle Bass or North Bass, that's how you did it. And uh, this is a typical group of guys taking, you know, ground crew taking out uh, you know, what would have been some of the cartage out to the, air, uh, out to the airplane for loading. Yeah, what's really interesting about that, you don't see any houses in the background. Absolutely. It, it, it's fascinating. Let me yeah. see if I, can, if I can go back here. Don't look like that today. Absolutely right. And, and if you look in the background of so, some of these old images, you'll notice you'll be able to place approximately where the airplane is and in the background is nothing other than just landscape and then Lake Erie in the background. It's really fascinating. So <clears throat> the aircraft was actually used as a school bus. So if you lived on Middle Bass or North Bass and you were of middle school or high school age, you got on this airplane early in the morning and you flew to South Bass Island. And then when school was over, you got back on the airplane and you flew back home, whether it was North Bass or Middle Bass. And that was between him, uh, the, the airline carrying people to and from Lon's Winery or for other purposes, getting things back and forth to the island. So it was a pretty busy schedule and it ran regularly and it was the lifeline of the islands. So if you consider for a moment Islanders and their Sunday finery, getting to the, uh, going to the airport to go, you know, maybe to go, I can only imagine going to the mainland to have dinner or to spend the weekend with friends or what have you. This is circa 1947. Uh, we don't know exa the exact date. We've asked around, but around 1947, we believe shortly after the war, these would have been Islanders. Some of them have been identified by some of our volunteers. And uh, they would have been using it to get back and forth to the island. And then, of course, reliable transportation for people that were perhaps ice fishing, as you see here. So ice fishing has always been just a huge summer 
or rather winter business for the islands. It goes back to the 1930s and the Ford Tri-Motor would have been integral to that. So <clears throat> it's hard to imagine now, but there was a period of time when Islanders would literally call the airport and give their grocery list to Mrs. Hirschberger, who would take down their name and take down their grocery list. And the next flight over, someone would go to the groceries for them and bring their groceries back. There was a time in the uh, winter of 1954 when livestock were literally uh, perishing because of lack of foodstuffs. They were running out of hay and running out of things to feed the livestock, whether it was cattle or horses or goats or what have you. And uh, the Hirschbergers took it upon themselves to go find hay, load it onto the airplane, and basically do an airlift to bring food to the livestock, to the livestock over on the islands, which I think is fascinating. Uh, so just to give you some idea of how important the trimotor was to the folks living on the island. Lastly, I'll tell you that another story, there was a horse that, don't ask me what all these terms are, I don't know, but there's a horse that was struggling with something called a gastric torsion, which apparently is a, a fatal condition. And it had very little time, not enough time to get, find a veterinarian, get a veterinarian over to the island to save the horse's life. Somehow they stuffed a full-grown horse into the Ford Trimotor while they arranged for a veterinarian to meet them at the airport. They flew a horse over to Port Clinton and saved the horse's life. So it's amazing. When we rode on it last summer, a year ago, they said they had loaded a herd of sheep on there one time. That's correct. That's right. That's correct. They, it was not uncommon for passengers to share the cabin with livestock. It was not uncommon at all. Uh, also, it was not uncommon to share, this is a little bit over the top, but it's true, to share the cabin with a corpse. It was used as their hearse. And, uh, you know, sometimes it was just a matter of fact. That's what you had to do. So, kind of interesting. An amazing history. So, anyway, I digress. This is a man by the name of Harold Houck. Harold Houck has more time in Ford Trimotors than anyone in the history of aviation. He stopped logging his time here at Island Airlines at 15,000 hours. Now, the route between Port Clinton, Middle Bass, I'm sorry, South Bass, Middle Bass, North Bass, Kelly's Island and back took 45 minutes and the furthest distance apart was 17 miles. So Harold flew a lot of routes. Um, it's estimated that uh, when he quit flying the Ford Trimotor, he had 17,000 hours in a Ford Trimotor. So <clears throat> Harold Houck uh, was probably the most famous of all the Island Airlines pilots, but certainly there were a number of them. And uh, the, the Ford Trimotor, which flew these routes here locally, um, as we understand aviation now um, and kind of the history of the Ford Trimotor, this is the only place in the world where this was done. I don't think most people appreciate that. This is the only place in the world where we use this kind of transportation to get to a small archipelago out on the Lake Erie Islands. Now, later on, after World War II, places like Charlevoix, Michigan, used aircraft to get to places like Beaver Island and some of the islands up that way. Uh, the Apostle Islands and so forth, but uh, the, certainly Putin Bay and Middle Bass and North Bass and Kelly's, they were, you might call them early adopters, uh, thanks to Milt Hirschberger. So that's kind of the history of Island Airlines. I could talk about it all, all afternoon, but any questions about Island Airlines? Yes. Uh, what did the inside of the trimotor look like? Did they have a lot of seats and then some empty space? Or right. So. Uh, the question was, what did the inside of the uh, Ford Trimotor look like? It, it looked pretty stark. Um, so there were some seats, and there were also some what they call sling seats. By the way, you couldn't get away with this now. The FAA would never allow this. Um, they had seats that were on uh, two aluminum posts, if you will, that folded up against the side of the aircraft, and they had a canvas sling. And you could pull those seats down, and sit in that sling and take a little 
canvas lap belt, and you know that was your seat belt. Um, but uh, there were also seats that had seat belts, but um, generally speaking, it was pretty stark. And the reason they used these sling seats is so that the interior can be could be easily and quickly converted for carrying things like, you know, barrels and and and, and fish and you know, cartage and people. So it was easily convertible. Um, the original Ford Tri-Motors were delivered with wicker seats. Wicker seats. And seat belts were options until 1937. You could buy an aircraft with a wicker seat that was not attached to the floor of the aircraft, that was literally removable, that did not have a seat belt. Until the Civil Aeronautics Authority, in all their wisdom, thought, hey, shouldn't these seats be attached to the floor, and shouldn't we have seat belts? So. Would you want to talk about the crash? Sure. Uh, we can talk a little bit about the crash. There were, uh, in, in the history of Island Airlines, there were three crashes. Uh, the first one was in August of 1954 on Kelly's Island. Um, it was a Sunday afternoon. A pilot by the name of Rosie Rosendahl had been called into work on his day off. And as the story goes, he wasn't real happy about that. Uh, he uh, <clears throat> barely had flying speed, was, pardon my French, a little, no, he was honked off that he was working. He pulled the aircraft off the ground prematurely and tried to zoom climb the airplane. And when he did that, the aircraft stalled about 30 feet above the ground and came straight down, um, destroying the aircraft. Um, the wings were still intact. They were actually sabotaged, or I, I shouldn't say it, removed from the aircraft and saved and hung up on, in the old uh, hangar over on Putin Bay for many, many, many decades they were hung up there. Um, and that aircraft was eventually taken to a place called the old Blue Hole on Kelly's Island. Anybody remember the Blue Hole on Kelly's Island? It's a swimming hole. And people used to say, <clears throat> there's a mail plane in the, in the Blue Hole. Well, that mail plane was the fuselage of a Ford Trimotor that crashed in 54. That was the first. No one was killed. The second crash was in 1972 when an aircraft lost an engine on departure. The aircraft swerved to the left, exited the runway, and did something called a ground loop where the centripetal force just literally carried the tail beyond the front of the nose of the aircraft, destroying the aircraft. Once again, because the aircraft is so well built and overbuilt, no one was hurt. Uh, a minor injury to the pilot um, and uh, that was it. And then the third crash, which ended Island Airlines for all practical purposes, was July 1st of 1977, when an aircraft departed South Bass Island, didn't even get outside of the fence on the airport, uh, fuel unported from the fuel tanks, apparently there was not a bunch of fuel on the aircraft, unported when they were in a, a positive angle of attack, all three engines quit at the same time, and the aircraft came down. Once again, no one was killed in that, that incident. So three aircraft accidents uh, for Island Airlines with Ford Trimotor. But a testament to really how well built they were. So good question. Was Dave Martin the pilot in that third crash? Uh, yes. Yes, he was. Dave Martin was the pilot in the third crash. Yeah. I mentioned Rosie Rosendahl because Rosie's long since departed the earth. Uh, Dave Martin's still around, so he probably doesn't doesn't appreciate me mentioning his name in this talk. But you asked, yeah, yeah. So with that, that's the history of Island Airlines. Any other questions? And uh, okay, hope I'm not putting anyone to sleep. Uh, we're we're going to now talk about our project and what we're doing. So I'm going to get just a glass of water here. So Island Airlines. We think Island Airlines is a, a, a cool and unique enough history that it deserves to be preserved. And there was a group of pilots sitting around a main hangar at Port Clinton in 2004, just kind of dreaming about, wouldn't it be great if we could preserve this history? And uh, so they started to work on it. And um, their hearts were in the right place, but they, they just, I don't think, had a good grasp of what it entailed. And uh, you know, I'm a local pilot, been flying around these parts for a long time, and 
I don't know exactly how this happened, but somehow my name came up and uh, I, they invited me to an event, uh, just a, a little uh, gathering in November of 08. I'll never forget it. <laughs> um, and we were talking about this project that they had taken on and um, they uh, said, well, we need someone really to, to guide the project. And I, fat, dumb, and stupid, sitting there looking around the table thinking, well, yeah, who's going to do that? And they all pointed at me, uh, which I thought, how, how did that happen? And at, at first I thought, wow, what a great honor, until I realized this is a Herculean project. I mean, this has been an amazingly big project, and I had no idea what I was getting into. To be honest with you, around, 19, uh, around 2012, I remember I'd raised about a half a million dollars on this project already. And I remember the evening when all of our volunteers left on a Thursday night, and I'm sitting there in the hangar, looking at all these parts on the floor of the airport floor, on the hangar floor, and I thought to myself, I'm in deep trouble here. I've, what am I going to do? Half a million dollars in public funds, and I've got nothing to show for it but a bunch of parts. So anyway, we, we persevered and worked really hard, and, and one of the men that started this, a guy by the name of Ken Benjamin. Anybody know, knew Ken Benjamin? So Ken was, Ken was a, quite a visionary. And uh, Ken said it best. When someone would ask, how are you going to do this? How are you going to build this airplane? That seems like folly to me. And he said, well, it's like eating an elephant, one bite at a time. So this is our, some of our volunteers. Our volunteers come from all walks of life. Uh, we have dentists, we have engineers, we have people that work in real estate, we have people that are retired, we have uh, farmers, we have people from all walks of life who've come to join and help in the restoration of this project. And just kind of as a side note, I mentioned that I had the great privilege of flying the Ford Trimotor in various places around the country, and it has been a privilege. But one of the things that shines through, whether you're in California or Florida, or New York, or Maine, or Illinois, it doesn't matter. If you show up with a Ford Trimotor, people invariably talk about Island Airlines and the Ford Trimotor, and it's it, all over the country. And I, I just found that to be really interesting that people talk about the Ford Trimotor and its relationship to Island Airlines all over the country. So it's all over the world. It's really known all over the place. And most people, I think, have trouble appreciating that. So. Anyway, um, this is one of our volunteers working on the interior. The interior is, uh, and, and uh, that's the exterior of the fuselage. Uh, and then this is the interior. Interior is kind of small. We like to say every seat is both an aisle seat and a window seat. Uh, so the interior is bamboo with uh, black walnut. Uh, this was taken a couple of years ago. If you see the project now, most of the interior is actually installed. Um, kind of in the background here, you can barely see it. You'll see a sconce on the wall, and you can start to see it right in front of his nose there. Um, interestingly, these Ford Trimotors, when they were delivered, they were delivered with a sconce on the wall for lighting, and each sconce has a separate switch. Now, we thought, we'll never find an original, so we're just going to leave that, until somebody showed up one day at our project with probably the only remaining Ford Trimotor sconce in history. There's probably no more anywhere. And he said, this is a Ford Trimotor sconce. We'd like, we thought you'd like to see it. So we were all amazed and we found someone who could reproduce it. So what we've done is taken the original sconce and actually had exact replicas made. And that'll be the lighting on the inside of the airplane, which we're kind of proud of. So, um, this is the back of the aircraft, the tail, if you will. This is one of our volunteers, a uh, fellow by the name of Jack DeVore, who grew up on uh, North Bass Island, volunteering. He's cutting, cutting a, a piece of the aluminum that actually was for the tail, uh, part of the section for the tail wheel. And that's the back of the aircraft, and that's where the tail wheel will go. Um, like I said, people come from all walks of life. Jack was what they called the flying barber. And Jack uh, lived in uh, Conneaut, Ohio, and he used to fly a Piper J3 Cub 
from Conneaut to South Bass Island to cut the hair of the men that lived on South Bass Island. They called him the Flying Barber until a man by the name of McCann, Mac McCann, said, hey, uh, Jack, maybe you ought to just live here and I'll rent you some space. So he ended up living on South Bass Island and, and he was the local barber. But he's one of our volunteers. Is that a Catalina in the background? Very good eye. Yes, it is. That's a Catalina PBY, and that's part of the Liberty Aviation Museum. So at the Liberty Aviation Museum, which, of which we're not a part, we're a tenant within the building in a separate not-for-profit. Uh, if you've not been to the Liberty Aviation Museum, do yourself a favor and go. We have the world's best example of a B-25. It's the best example in the world, and it flies. We have a TBM Avenger, which is the aircraft that uh, George Bush Sr. flew in the South Pacific. It's the finest example of a TBM Avenger in the world. Very rare aircraft. Those are both the best examples in the world. And then we have a third aircraft, which is the Catalina PBY. Extremely rare aircraft, and that aircraft is airworthy also. Um, we also have something called an AT-6, which is a North American trainer, World War II trainer, it is not the finest example in the world, but it's got to be one of the top 10. All right here in Port Clinton, which is astonishing. So if, if you haven't had a chance to go, go, go check it out. They're amazing airplanes. So anyway, it's our goal as restorers. Here's a, a, another view of our restorers a couple of years ago, some of them. It's our goal to create, recreate the flight for uh, passengers, a historic flight, uh, what they call living history ride, as close to the original as possible. But we're taking the opportunity to actually upgrade some of the systems in the airplane, places where you'd never think. As an example, our seats will not be wicker. They'll, they'll be a hardened steel, and they're capable of a, what's called a 10G pull. So uh, they're as strong as any seat that you'd find in an airline flight. If you're going from here to Orlando, your seat would, in our aircraft will be just as strong as that aircraft. In addition to that, although this, the instrument panel will look original, behind that instrument panel we have some rather advanced um, information. Like as an example, uh, it'll be uh, we'll be able to take an iPod, iPad with us, an Apple iPad, and information will be transmitted to that iPad about uh, aircraft collision avoidance. So we'll know where other aircraft are that are in our airspace. We'll know wh where weather is, and we'll be able to use GPS guidance now the instrument panel will look original, but all that information will be available to us as if we were flying a modern aircraft. So um, anyway, that's part of our mission is to make the aircraft as original as possible to the traveling public, but yet those operating the aircraft will have this, uh, you know, top shelf safety, you know, cutting, cutting edge safety equipment. Okay, so this is us uh, back in July and August uh, painting the aircraft, uh, again, our volunteers. And then this is shortly after we were done painting the aircraft and before we put it on its landing gear. You can see that's the old red, white, and blue uh, livery for Island Airlines. That's the livery that most people remember for Island Airlines. Uh, point of fact is most of the Island Airlines aircraft were just raw aluminum with a black painting on it that said Island Air Service. But around 1974, to uh, celebrate the country's bicentennial, um, they were all painted red, white, and blue. And since that's the livery that most people remember, that's what we decided on as the aircraft uh, design that we would use. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure who that fellow is, uh, but um, that that I, I was the guy that uh, was in charge of uh, designing and installing the instrument panel, and that's early in the process. That that's uh, sort of fitting the instruments before putting the, the panel together. And uh, on the next slide, that's the completed instrument panel. That's exactly the way this instrument panel would have looked when it came off of the floor in uh, 1929. Okay, exactly. Um, and so we're real proud of that. And they used something called a crinkle finish back in those days. And it's kind of a rough black that's on the instrument panel. We were able, even able to recreate that. It took us three times to recreate it, but we finally were able to do it. Um, and then this is the aircraft in September. As you can see, we're just about done. Now, 
Um, I want to tell you that the all the major components on the aircraft are complete, every one of them. So the wings are done, tail surfaces are done, the fuselage is done, the interior is practically done, the instrument panel is done, the pedostatic system is done, and the fuel systems are almost done. What remains are the engine installations and then the, what they call the nacelles. And that the nacelles will be the aluminum that will cover the back of the engine mounts. Um, and uh, once that's completed, we'll begin flight testing. So uh, we'll take delivery of our first engine in about a week. And then uh, sometime in uh, well, late December, early January, we'll take delivery of the second engine. And the third engine we hope to have delivered sometime around March. Uh, and then the engines will be installed. The wings will be placed on the aircraft. And then the fun begins. So, Are these engines they have the same horsepower as the original one? Oh, that's a great question. The engines that we're installing on the aircraft are Pratt & Whitney engines. These engines were originally Wright Whirlwind engines, 420 horsepower each. The Pratt & Whitney engines are 450 horsepower each. And the reason we're using Pratt & Whitney is those components are still available in the open market. It would be very difficult to service the uh, old Wright Whirlwind engines. You just can't find parts for them. So the gentleman that'll be rebuilding these engines is out of uh, Oklahoma. It's called Tulsa Aircraft Engines. When these aircraft engines are rebuilt, they'll look absolutely brand new. They're like little Swiss watches. They're beautiful and they will run extremely well and be very reliable. Uh, Pratt Whitney still supports these aircraft in the, uh, in the field. Are all three engines identical? All three engines are identical, correct. It's called the Pratt & Whitney R985 Wasp Junior engine, 450 horsepower each. With all that horsepower, you'd think the thing would go 1,000 miles an hour. It goes about 90 on a good day. So our aircraft has a really interesting um, historical, uh, uh, what do I want to say? Uh, its pedigree is interesting and historical, I guess is what I want to say. So our aircraft was... Uh, built in April of 1929, came off the assembly line on April 2nd, and on May 1st was delivered to Mexico City, where the aircraft was Aeromexico's first aircraft. So this aircraft started Aeromexico. Um, in 1931, it was sold to a man by the name of Juan Tripp. Does that name mean anything to anyone in this room? So, uh, Juan Tripp started Pan American Airways, and Juan Tripp was uh, really considered the herald, the Howard Hughes of his day. He was kind of a, an air type, a risk taker, very well to do, and uh, he bought this airplane in 1931, and his signatures actually appear in our logbook, which is historically important. Um, this is the only known picture of our aircraft flying under the Pan Am banner. This aircraft flew from Key West to Havana and back. That was the route that the aircraft flew. And if you're familiar at all with Key West, there's a restaurant um, on the corner of Green Street and Whitehead Street, um, which was the original headquarters of Pan Am. And that would be where this aircraft was dispatched, from which this aircraft was dispatched back in the day. Um, and it flew for Pan Am and in Havana and Key West until 1946 when the aircraft was sold to Island Airlines. And uh, Milt Hersberger went down to Havana and flew this aircraft from Havana back to Port Clinton, Ohio in 1946. Uh, it operated for Island Airlines between 1946 and 1952. It was eventually sold in August of 1952 to a company called Johnson Flying Service out of Missoula, Montana. Now, Johnson Flying Service uh, was known for um, using these aircraft for what they called smoke jumping, where these aircraft would fly behind uh, forest fires in the Rocky Mountains, particularly in Montana and Idaho, and uh, young men would jump out of the aircraft with picks and shovels, and jump out of the aircraft and try to get in front of these forest fires and build fire breaks. And that's how our aircraft was used for 29 days 
when it crashed in a high mountain airstrip. Um, it crashed in a high mountain airstrip in a place called Flathead, Montana. And it remained there in a heap until 1984 um, when a man uh, out of Kalamazoo, Michigan, a man by the name of Maurice Hovius, rented a flatbed bed truck and drove out to Missoula and talked to the owners of Johnson Flying Service and told them he would like to collect that wreckage and he asked if he could buy the paperwork. And he sold them the paperwork for the airplane, which is incredibly important for airworthy purposes, for one dollar. And then he went up into the mountains and collected all the components of this airplane, which eventually ended up here in Port Clinton. And that's the airplane that we started rebuilding. Now the interesting thing about that airplane was that, again, I told you we were a bit naive when we started. That airplane had been sitting out in the mountains, the high mountains, from 1952 until 1984. So 32 years. But we thought it's aluminum. How bad could it be? <laughs> it was bad. And uh, much worse than we'd anticipated. So as a result, we had to start over. And there are no uh, records, or at least there weren't at the time, uh, for Ford trimotors. I spent two days up at the Henry Ford Museum actually going through old records and it turns out there are microfiche, something like 170,000 pages of microfiche for the Ford trimotor. The problem is they're not in any order <laughs> and they're, using them was basically a, just a futile act. So what we had was the components, the raw components to reverse engineer the aircraft. And if we got into a position where we were stuck, we would send someone up to Greenfield Village uh, or, or Henry Ford Museum and try to seek out that piece of microfiche, which was valuable to our restoration, which we had to do on a couple of occasions. Because the FAA says in order for this airplane to be registered as a 1929 Ford Trimotor, serial number 40, the paperwork isn't enough. Every rivet has to be in the same place. Every component has to be the same size. Every piece of this aircraft under the law has to be of equal or greater strength than the original. So you can imagine when we first got this airplane here and we realized that we couldn't rebuild what we had, to say we were crestfallen was just a, maybe an understatement. But uh, we worked through it. And uh, this is November 7584, the very first Ford Trimotor that um, was delivered, as I said, from October of 1936. It's the airplane that flew until July 1st, 1977. Although eight aircraft had come and gone, it was the first and the one that stayed the longest. So that's a picture of 7584. And then this is the sister ship, which was sold November 7684 which was sold in 1976. And that was the last year that aircraft was used here. So that's the history of Island Airlines and maybe a little perspective on our restoration effort. Um, thank you so much for your time and attention today. Like I said, a great honor for me to be here and to talk about this with you. And if there are any questions, I'd be glad to entertain them. Yes, sir. Yeah, so could you give us some sense of what, when you finally put this thing in the air, what kind of approval or inspection process from the FAA or any other regulatory agencies you're going to need right. before you can actually go up and... That's a great question. So the question is, once the airplane is restored and ready to fly, what do we need to do to get the blessing of the FAA to fly the aircraft under Part 91 to do living history rides? Well, we have a good relationship with... Uh, the Cleveland Flight Standards District Office, as well as the Grand Rapids, Michigan Flight Standards District Office. They are the group that oversee our restoration and oversee aircraft that are flying in this particular airspace and, and uh, registration of those aircraft. Um, they've been part of the process from the beginning. We thought it was important if we were gonna do this and undertake this effort and raise the funds to do this, to have them be part of it. So since they've been involved from the beginning and we have paperwork that's in good order and we've met 
all of the necessary thresholds along the way, really all it takes is one signature, a sign off of someone called a DER, a designated engineering representative, which we have a good relationship with. And uh, they'll sign the aircraft off, I'm confident of that. Once it's signed off, we'll do flight tests. Those flight tests will be done by the pilot that draws the uh, short straw. And uh, uh, chances are the airplane won't fly perfectly straight right out of the box. We'll do high-speed taxi tests and then short flights. And then eventually, you know, when I say short flights, 200-foot flights on the runway and then 500-foot flights. And then ultimately swallow hard, take the airplane for a ride. And it is possible, and it's not unusual, for an airplane to fly with a slight crab angle or one one wing heavier than the other for a period of while until you tune the aircraft or get the airplane rigged properly. So that'll be the process. Once it's rigged properly and we fly it for a number of hours and we're confident that the public can fly the airplane safely, then we'll start doing living history rides on uh, Saturdays and Sundays um, during summer months out of Port Clinton and South Bass Island. Um, and with the goal of uh, just keeping the airplane flying. When we're done, the airplane is, belongs to no one except the foundation so that long after we're gone, this airplane is a gift to the community that will preserve the history in perpetuity. And hopefully 100 years from now, uh, people will still have an interest in re, you know, going for a ride in the old Ford Trimotor. So uh, as we approach the end of the year here, uh, if you have uh, some idea about charities and what you'd like to give to, we think our charity is worthwhile and we could use your help. We're about $80,000 away from completing the airplane, which actually is a drop in the bucket when you consider the 2.4 million we've raised thus far. So uh, that's our story. Okay. Yes, sir. So Island Airlines ceased existence in 77? It did continue. It uh, continued until I think 1985. But uh, the aircraft that were flown uh, it, it, starting in 19, the summer, late summer of 77, were aircraft like Cessna 172s, uh, Cessna 206, uh, uh, the um, Cherokee 6, and aircraft like that. They weren't the old antique aircraft. So the Ford Trimotor is probably the standard bearer of what most people think of as Island Airlines. But there was also an aircraft called a Boeing 247 that flew for Island Airlines. There was a, a de Havilland Otter and a de Havilland Beaver that flew for Island Airlines. But Island Airlines, as we know it, knew, uh, as we knew it, pretty much ceased to exist on January 1st of '77 with the crashing of that aircraft. It did continue until '85 with these other light aircraft. But those light aircraft, although they they did the yeoman's work of getting people and cartage back and forth from the island. They were really nothing special about those aircraft at that time. So none of the Trimotors flew after 77? That's right, not for Island Airlines. That's right. Now that November 7584 was restored by a company called Cal Aero up in Kalamazoo, Michigan. That airplane was brought back here in 1985. The FAA said you could no longer use that aircraft for Island Airlines. So um, that aircraft was purchased by a man named Al Cheney out of Mansfield who flew that aircraft locally, kind of barnstorming and flying the aircraft. Now, that aircraft was eventually sold to an aircraft a collector by the name of Kermit Weeks out of Florida, and it was uh, destroyed, destroyed by Hurricane Hugo uh, when Hurricane Hugo came ashore. And so that airplane was once again destroyed. The funny thing is it was moved from its hangar to Homestead Air Force Base because it was such a valuable airplane even then. Um, that it was moved to Homestead Air Force Base in an effort to protect it from Hurricane Hugo, but that hangar that it was moved to, ironically, was destroyed by Hurricane Hugo. So, yes, ma'am. So, was the Tin Goose Diner part of part of your foundation? Uh, no, the Tin Goose Diner is part of the Liberty Air Museum, which again is a separate not-for-profit. Um, we are a tenant within the Liberty Air Museum. We basically have space in one of the corners of hangar number two. The Tin Goose Diner is a diner that came from Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania. It was actually a diner uh, that started operating in 1940, thereabouts. Um, and uh, 
the owner or the benefactor of Liberty Air Museum, a man by the name of Ed Patrick, uh, purchased this diner from Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania, and sent it to a place to be restored to its original condition, and then moved it to the hangar number one at Liberty Air Museum uh, to recreate a diner experience at the airport. Now, uh, I, I will say that the hours of the diner are somewhat irregular in the off season, and it's a bit uh, mysterious to me as to why it's like that, but I don't ask questions, I just do my job. Now, so, What's the history of the one that's giving rides now? Uh, where did that come from? That is a great question. So there are five, I'm sorry, five <laughs> Ford Tri-Motors flying uh, these days. Um, there are 18 that are currently um, on the FAA roster. The five that are flying, the one you're talking about could be one of two. Um, the first is the Eastern Air Transport aircraft, which I had a picture of, which is Eastern Airlines' first aircraft. Uh, that's the aircraft that I had the great pleasure of flying around uh, to various air shows a few years back. Um, that is owned by the EAA, the Experimental Aircraft Association out of Oshkosh, Wisconsin. They restored that aircraft in an effort to try to keep the idea and the spirit of the Ford Tri-Motor and early airline travel alive and that history alive. So that could be one of the aircraft. The other is the TAT aircraft, and that's the predecessor to Transworld Airlines, Transcontinental Air Transport, which that airplane, <clears throat> uh, the Spirit of Columbus, or the City of Columbus, was the aircraft that was used in the first flights, Transcontinental, starting in 1928. Now, without boring you too much, let me just digress here. Um, <clears throat> Transcontinental Air Transport was, as I said, a 48-hour ticket from New York to Los Angeles. And here's how this worked. You got on a train in the evening on, uh, in New York, and you went by train to Columbus, Ohio. In the morning, you got off of that train, went across the street, and got on this airplane, the one that you flew in, that's owned by Liberty Air Museum. And you flew that airplane all day to a little town called Winoka, Oklahoma. And that would take all day. And they did it in all kinds of weather, it's amazing. Then you would get off that airplane, cross the street, get on another train. Take that train through the Rockies to a place called Clovis, New Mexico. And in Clovis, New Mexico, in the morning, you would get off of that train and get on your last Ford Trimotor, the city of Pasadena, and you would fly in that airplane from Clovis, New Mexico to Pasadena, California. It took 48 hours at a cost of a little over $500 in 1928. Now TAT, knowing that passenger air travel was definitely in its infancy and not for everyone, hired both Amelia Earhart and Charles Lindbergh to act as spokesmen, spokespeople for TAT. Now, it is true that Charles Lindbergh did fly that aircraft on a couple of occasions, once to fly Henry Ford and once just to go for a ride to fly the airplane. He was never pressed into service. He never flew for TAT, although that's the common wisdom. And Amelia Earhart never flew for TAT at all. But they were spokespeople for them. And that was an effort to try to get people to appreciate air travel and uh, they, it's kind of, some people were under the maybe misguided notion that Amelia Earhart could be my pilot, so. <laughs> Back in the 70s, we would fly the Boy Scouts out for honor camp to put in bay. Yes. And when we rode on, my son took me on this one last, a year ago, it was finished off a lot better than the old ones that we used to take the Scouts on. I mean, I could picture sheep going on that. Right, right. So, uh. You know, the, these old Ford Tri-Motors were, they were basically old scows. There's just no other way to say it. They were used as utilitarian aircraft. This was a lifeline and it wasn't, a, it wasn't like, a, it wasn't glamorous by any stretch of the imagination. It was people flying back and forth as needed. Um, so they were not very nice inside, that's for sure. You have a question, sir. Wasn't the tank was particularly suited for the islands because of its payload and very heavy lift? That's a, yeah, 
Right. So I, I said I would get into the uh, the uh, rattlesnake island idea, and, and I, I'm sorry I, I glossed over that, um, but that's an important point. So Milt Hirschberger, uh, knowing of the Ford Trimotor, knew it would be a perfect airplane for his for his he, his needs. He just simply couldn't afford one. Um, and the Ford Trimotor was perfect because it has a cord on the on the front of the aircraft, the front of the wing. This is called the cord. And that cord, that from top to bottom, on the center section of the aircraft, is about 37 inches. It's a super wide wing. The very thing that makes it slow is the very thing that provides incredible lift. And the airstrip on uh, Rattlesnake Island is 1,200 feet. And they could get this airplane in and out of Rattlesnake Island with full passengers and full fuel. So it's amazing that they were able to do that. Um, and it speaks to the perfect design that the Ford Trimotor was to island air service and to our purposes of using it for island air travel. Uh, it, it's just literally the perfect design for that, that purpose. Great question. Any other questions? I have some. Um, this is a tidbit. But you mentioned about the horse and the sheep. Yes. Um, when South Bass Island was bought by Joseph D. Rivera, he set that up <coughs> with farms. He, he wanted it to be a community. He had bought six islands, but South Bass Island was one of them. Now, he, those farmers were out there, and they had pigs. And some of those pigs escaped from the farm, <coughs> and they became razorbacks just like you have down south. They used to go out hunting for them on South Bass Island. They'd set up hunts for razorbacks. Not a lot of people know that. I didn't know that. I had no idea of that. I, I knew of the old pheasant hunt over on Peely Island. Oh, yeah. And they would use the trimotor to get hunters back and forth for that. Um, so I, I know that I've gone on long, but I just have to tell you this story because I'm, I'm absolutely amazed by it. Um, I told you about this man by the name of Harold Houck who had 17,000 hours, we estimate, uh, in four dry motors. When Harold got older, um, he and I were friends, and uh, I was in college at the time at Ohio State, and uh, I would spend, my family had a, a place on South Bass Island, the old log cabin that's at, at the airport there. And uh, Harold used to hang around the airport. I, I think Harold knew nothing else except airplanes. So it, it was uh, just a great time for him to watch airplanes come and go. So I got to know Harold. And uh, one day, uh, Harold, uh, who was a member of a, a place uh, downtown called the Cruise Nest, I believe it was called, um, he, he, he said, Jody, w would you want to go downtown for have a beer with me? Of course, I was a college kid. Are you kidding? That was like... Candy in front of a baby. Heck yeah, Harold, I'll go with you. So I think Harold was in his early 80s, bless you, early 80s by that time, and I was probably 21. Um, I was fascinated by this guy, and we went, went down to the cruise nest, and we sat there and drank a couple of beers together, and he started telling me about some of his flying experiences. And by this time, I had been flying for probably five years or something like that, and uh, you know, it was something we had in common, although I, f I didn't have anything on Harold Houck. He was just obviously an amazing pilot. Uh, anyway, sitting there having a beer with him, and he said, uh, telling me a story one day about when he took off from South Bass Island with a full complement of passengers. And he said, uh, and I lost the engine. I lost the nose engine. And I, I looked at him, I said, well, no big deal. It has two more engines. He says, uh, Jody, I don't think you fully appreciate where I'm coming from on this. When I say I lost the engine, I mean the engine spun off of the airplane and took off. And uh, he had a full complement of passengers on board the aircraft. And he said the aircraft immediately was out of center of gravity and the tail dropped like this and he was losing control of the aircraft until he got all the passengers as far forward as he could literally as far forward as he could, got them all out of their seats and moved them forward, regained control of the aircraft, brought it back and landed safely without incident. That's a testament to this guy's piloting skills and it's a true story.
<laughs> no, there, there's some conjecture about where that engine is. Uh, there are those that say it's on the bottom of the lake, and there uh, some have said, well, we're going to get a mag magnetometer and find that darn engine. And there are others that said, no, it landed in a field on South Bass Island. So truth is, I don't know where that engine is right now. I've heard both stories, but I have confirmed that that actually did happen to him. And it's an amazing story. And, and uh, Lisa, you said that your dad, I think it was your dad, you said you believed, he said, in the co-pilot seat. That was a common practice that, um, yeah, Harold would invite people. Harold would invite people to uh, sit in the co-pilot seat. He was very open about that and actually thought it would be a great thrill to have passengers fly in the co-pilot seat. And it was not uncommon for him to ask passengers who had never flown an airplane before, would you like to take the wheel? And some of them would look at him with total amazement, like, are you joking? And he'd be, no, I'm not joking. It, uh, it's okay, I'll, I'll follow, you know, I'll follow through, control the airplane for a few minutes. That's the way he was. He was just that kind of a person. And there's lots of stories of that as well. Now, I'm sure if you asked to land the airplane, you probably wouldn't like that too much, but yes. Was there another door besides the one that you see on the pictures to get? <laughs> no, one door. I have no idea. I have no idea. But it was a horse that was in, I guess, real pain. Oh, it would be and it, yeah, it was probably very cooperative. Um, but again, you know, someone was talking about pigs. They were pigs and goats and sheep and chickens. I mean, this is all on the passenger manifests. Uh, they put these things in the airplane with passengers. You know, all these the animals that you mentioned yeah. give many opportunities opportunities for reenactments. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm going to get that past the volunteers, but we'll we'll give it a shot. Um, the right, right. Plus, the seat belts are really small. You mentioned about moving around. Yeah, we we did that a lot. He would make people even out the weight of the aircraft before you take off. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Very common. They would they would ask you your weight and put us uh, have a seat for you. Which brings me to the question of you have to have everything standard to what it was. Correct. How do you justify the chairs being, the seats being changed from wicker to metal? There's got to be, I mean, the weight alone has to right. change the logistics of it. That is a great question. Now, the, the letter of the FAA regulation says each component must be of equal quality or better. So what we've done is we've actually... Uh, taken our seat design. We've had it inspected by a designated engineering representative of the FAA. And then we've done something called a 10G pull. Now the FAA assumes that each of us in this room weigh 175 pounds. It, I don't question the FAA. I just say, yes, that sounds about right. And so what we do is we have put each of them through a pull test of, uh, it has to exceed 1,750 pounds. And if it can do that, then it passes the test. So uh, um, th that's what, and believe me, I said earlier that the airplane won't go 120 miles an hour off a cliff with a tailwind. You're never going to pull 10 Gs on this airplane, ever. It's just never going to happen. So we feel as though we're providing a responsible, historic flight that uh, offers uh, all, of the, all of the best uh, safety features as well as uh, you know, some sense of what it must have been like. Um, we cannot use the aircraft to fly from Port Clinton to South Bass to Middle Bass. We cannot use it as an airliner. The FAA says under Part 91 that we can fly the aircraft from a point of departure, fly within a 25 statute mile radius, and return to the airport of departure. So that's how we're going to operate the aircraft. But if you think about what 25 statute miles is for us, whether we depart from South Bass Island or from Port Clinton, we can see Cedar Point, Kelly's Island, North Bass, Middle Bass, and South Bass. So we can recreate the flights without actually doing the landings. And that's, thank you so much for your time. Great. Thank you so much for your time. I, I, I wanted to mention one more. I, I, I flew a lot on Nylon Airlines. And nine o'clock was their mail run. And so we 
I would want to go to South Bass Island. <laughs> so we, we'd leave Port Clinton, we'd go to Kelly's. Then we'd go from Kelly's to Middle Bass. Middle Bass to North Bass, North Bass to Rattlesnake, and then I could get off at yeah. Putin Bay. Just to go to Putin Bay, that you hit all the ideas. Wow. <laughs> what, a, what an interesting Friday evening. That'd be fun. That'd be fun. I want to thank you all so much for your time and attention. It's a great honor to stand here and give you our history and talk a little bit about Island Airlines. And uh, I just want to say thank you. So thanks very much. Thank you.